Hi everyone. We're going to discuss sensory perception today. And the first thing that we're going to examine with sensory perception is we're going to talk about sensory receptors. Now, sensory receptors are specialized to respond to changes in their environment. So the different stimuli that our bodies are exposed to every day. And sensory receptors, when they're activated, can result in graded potentials that trigger nerve impulses. Now our sensation is the awareness of the stimulus that we're being exposed to. And then we have our perception, the interpretation of the meaning of the stimulus, that occurs in the brain. And for the sensory system, remember there's an afferent input which relays information from the periphery of the body to the central nervous system. And those are the dendritic receptors that we have in our joints, our skin, our muscles, and our sense organs, like our mouth, eye, nose, and ear. The sensory receptors convert that physical and chemical environmental changes into electrical impulses. And then we have the motor system, the efferent outflow, which carries command signals from the central nervous system to peripheral effectors. Remember with the skeletal system, we talked about the somatic uh, motor output, and there's other output efferent um, output signals like to your cardiac muscles and your glands. Now sensory receptors can be classified by their location. An introreceptor, an extroreceptor, and a proprioreceptor. An introreceptor is also sometimes known as a visceroceptor and it responds to stimuli arising in the internal viscera and blood vessels of the body. Introreceptors are located in our vessel walls, in our organs, and in the medulla and hypothalamus. Examples might be uh, blood pressure, responding to changes in blood pressure, osmolarity, the solute concentration of our body fluids, or oxygen levels in our blood. Extraceptors respond to stimuli arising outside the body. Most of these are our special sense organs. These receptors are located near the surface of the skin to detect external stimuli. Examples are vision, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. And then we have proprioceptors, which respond to stretch in our skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, ligaments, and connective tissue coverings of our bones and muscles. These receptors gather information about position and motion of body parts and help you to maintain balance, allowing us to know where your limbs are and gives, gives us an awareness of the tension in our muscles. Receptors can also be classified by stimulus type. Nociceptors are sensitive to pain-causing stimuli, extremes of heat or cold, or excessive pressure, or inflammatory chemicals that might be released during tissue damage. These are free, bare, dendritic nerve endings in the skin and organs. Thermoreceptors are sensitive to changes in temperature, not the extremes like that would be painful, those would come from nociceptors. Thermoreceptors are found in our skin and hypothalamus. Chemoreceptors respond to chemicals like smell, taste, changes in blood chemistry, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, or pH. And mechanoreceptors respond to touch, pressure, vibration, stretch, and itch. These receptors detect physical changes that have come about when the receptor is deformed. Examples are hearing and equilibrium. Now the other thing that you can see there is receptors can be further subcategorized. So nociceptors can be further subcategorized by the type of myelination and fiber that is carrying the painful sensation. Type A fibers are myelinated fibers that carry sensations of fast pain, so acute pain. And that would make sense because remember when a fiber is myelinated, the nerve impulse can travel very quickly. 
And when you acutely injure yourself, it's important that we become aware of that immediately. Unmyelinated type C fibers carry sensations of slow pain, like a headache, for example. So we would not be uh, need to be aware of this type of painful stimuli immediately. So it can be tr it can travel to our central nervous system on an unmyelinated fiber track. And then mechanoreceptors can be further subclassified as proprioceptors, which we just talked about, baroreceptors, which detect pressure changes in the walls of blood vessels and in some portions of the digestive, reproductive, and urinary tracts, and then tactile receptors, which we talked about previously in the integumentary system. Tactile receptors provide sensations of touch, pressure, and vibration. Another thing about receptors is the receptive field. There is a distinct receptive field for each receptor. And in order to stimulate a response in that receptor, the receptor must be stimulated within that receptive field. The closer to the center of the receptive field that the stimulation occurs might mean a stronger response as opposed to out in the periphery of the receptive field. So there's some general sensory receptors. Um, they're relatively simple in structure and they're very widely distributed in the body. And we've talked about some of these previously, but we're gonna look at them in a little more detail here. Free nerve endings, root hair plexus, and tactile discs or Merkel cells. Free nerve endings um, are branched dendrites of sensory neurons. They are not protected by any accessory structures. They're very nonspecific. They can respond to tactile, pain, and temperature stimuli. And these types of nerve endings are the most common receptors of the skin. You'll notice that they are located towards the upper layers of the skin, which means we don't need a very strong response to elicit a, a response in these receptors. Root hair plexus or hair follicle plexus are mechanoreceptors and they're found wherever hairs are located. The nerve endings of a root hair plexus will monitor distortions and movements across the surface of the body. When a hair is displaced, the movement of the follicle distorts the sensory dendrites and produces an action potential. And one thing you'll notice is that these receptors adapt very rapidly. So that means that if your hair, for example, from the wind is continued to be distorted, your body would not become, uh, be constantly aware of that stimuli. Um, you would initially, and then your body would know that, okay, it's windy outside. We don't need to constantly make you aware of unnecessary stimuli, which can cause um, overstimulation within your central nervous system. Some receptors you'll see do not adapt very rapidly, like the nociceptors, which respond to very painful stimuli. We would not want those types of receptors to adapt. You would need to be consistently aware of the pain that you are experiencing so that you could address it. Tactile discs or Merkel cells are mechanoreceptors that respond to fine touch and pressure. They're extremely sensitive with very small receptive fields, and um, they are single myelinated afferent fibers found in the upper part of the epidermis, the stratum basale. Other types of general sensory receptors are the lamellated corpuscles or pacinian corpuscles, tactile corpuscles, or Meisner's corpuscles, and Ruffini corpuscles. So tactile corpuscles, or Meisner's corpuscles, are mechanoreceptors that provide sensations of fine touch and pressure and low frequency vibrations. They adapt to stimulation within a second after contact. And they're fairly large structures, and they're most abundant in the eyelids, lips, 
fingertips, and some external genitalia. Ficinian corpuscles are mechanoreceptors that are sensitive to deep pressure. And you'll notice on the integumentary picture previously, they are located deeper within the integumentary system within the dermis. So that would make sense that they would need a deeper type of stimulation in order to elicit a response in them. They are fast adapting receptors and they're most sensitive to high frequency vibrating stimuli. Ruffini's corpuscles are mechanoreceptors that are sensitive to pressure and distortion of the deep dermis. These receptors are slow adapting or non-adapting. Now the five special senses that we're going to focus on are olfaction, gustation, hearing, balance, and equilibrium. The first special sense that we will look at is olfactory sensation. And the sense of smell, one of the first things that you need to know about the sense of smell, is that it is a chemical sense. So the sense of smell or olfaction is where we have chemoreceptors that respond to chemicals in an aqueous solution. And you can see the olfactory organs are shown in the diagram. They're composed of two layers, a lamina propria, and an olfactory epithelium. The lamina propria contains the olfactory glands, the olfactory epithelium contains a layer of cells that are sensitive to odorants. Those odorants, again, have to be dissolved in an aqueous solution. The olfactory epithelium also has other types of cells associated with it. Olfactory receptor cells, supporting cells, and basal cells. And you can see the different cell types shown here. Olfactory receptor cells are bipolar neurons. And the supporting cells are epithelial cells that insulate the olfactory receptor cells. The basal cells are olfactory stem cells and they divide via mitosis and can differentiate into olfactory receptor cells. Therefore, they can replace those worn out receptor cells. You can also see the olfactory cilia and the olfactory bulb is shown in this picture as well. The axons of the olfactory receptor cells collect into bundles that will go through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and they will ultimately constitute the filaments of the olfactory nerve that will synapse with the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb can then transmit the impulse towards the brain via the olfactory tracts, which will reach the olfactory cortex within the temporal lobe of the cerebrum. Now, olfactory physiology again is going to be, this, the physiology for olfaction is going to be very similar for the other senses. You're going to have a stimulus that will um, elicit a response in the den dendritic cells. And if the threshold is reached, the, um, an action potential will result. Now, one of the things that happens in um, the physiology of olfaction is the binding of that odorant molecule um, to its appropriate receptor leads to the activation of second messenger systems. And those second messenger systems can then open sodium channels, which would cause the membrane to be depolarized. In other words, it's excited. If sufficient depolarization occurs and threshold is reached, an action potential will be triggered, and that information will be sent to the central nervous system. So the recognition of our sense is due to patterns of activity in the brain that can arise from the activation of many different combinations of olfactory receptors. 
The olfactory cortex is located within the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. And if you lose your sense of smell, that can be one disorder that's associated with olfaction. Now, another basic sense that we're going to discuss is gustation or taste. So gustation or taste provides information about the foods and liquids that we consume. And we do have taste receptor cells or gustatory receptors that are distributed over the superior surface of the tongue and in the adjacent portions of the pharynx and larynx. And you examine some of the taste buds in lab. The superior surface of the tongue is covered in um, projections called papillae. And there's three types of lingual papillae. Circumvallate papillae. These are found on the posterior margin of the tongue. Fungiform papillae, which are scattered over the anterior surface of the tongue. Filiform papillae, hair-like papillae scattered all over the tongue. They do not have taste buds associated with them. And the foliate papillae, which are elongated mucosal folds found on the back sides of the tongue. And these papillae possess taste buds along their sides. So taste buds are sensory receptors that are located within epithelia and they're exposed to the external environment. Um, many of the papillae contain taste receptors in these sensory structures called taste buds. We have many, many taste buds. When we are young, as an adult, we possess only about half of the taste buds. And then as we continue to age, we have less than a third of the taste buds that remain. So let's look at a taste bud in a little more detail. It does contain different types of cells. It contains the gustatory receptor cell. The gustatory receptor cell is an epithelial cell that extends um, along, it extends um, in microvilli, which are called the gustatory hairs, into the surrounding fluid through the taste pore. Taste, remember, is also a sensation that is a, based on a chemical sense or a chemoreceptor. So the taste um, that we're trying to determine must be dissolved in an aqueous solution like our saliva. We also have supporting cells that um, are associated with the taste buds. And just like with olfaction, we have basal cells, gustatory stem cells that can divide by mitosis and replace our worn out or injured taste buds. So four sensations of taste can be distinguished and there really is no difference in the structure of our taste buds. The taste buds in all portions of the tongue provide all four basic taste sensations. So sweet is stimulated by sugars, alcohol, saccharin, and some amino acids. Salty is stimulated by sodium chloride and other inorganic salts. Sour is stimulated by acid and bitter is stimulated by alkaloids like nicotine or caffeine. There has been a new sensation of taste that has been identified, umami, which was identified by the Japanese and appears to be responsible for the beef taste of steak or that of aging cheese. Um, this particular taste can only be detected by the circumvallate papillae. So the physiology of taste, again, in order for something to be tasted, a chemical must be dissolved in saliva, and it must come into contact with those gustatory hairs. The binding of the food chemical, the tastent, can depolarize the taste cell membrane, causing the release of a neurotransmitter, and that can initiate an action potential 
um, which can travel along the gustatory pathway to the central nervous system. And so similar response here with gustation as what we saw with olfaction. We have a binding of the tastant, depolarize the membrane, release of neurotransmitter, and action potential can result. Now, the gustatory um, cortex is shown here. Um, and you can see that our taste sense is served by three cranial nerves. So the dendrites of the gustatory cells, again, they extend through a pore in the taste bud. The receptor responds to chemicals dissolved in saliva, causes an action potential nerve impulse, and the impulse travels out of the tongue on facial nerve 7, glossopharyngeal nerve 9, or vagus nerve 10. Each of these cranial nerves can carry impulses from the taste buds to the medulla oblongata, the solitary nucleus of the medulla oblongata. The impulse then travels to the thalamus and from there the fibers branch to the primary gustatory cortex in the insula and the hypothalamus and limbic system, which gives us an appreciation of our taste. Now, the um, disorder or loss is, uh, is the only um, pathophysiology associated with taste, where you would have an impairment or loss of your taste sense. Now, Auditory sensations are the next special sense that we're going to examine, hearing, and there is some basic overall anatomy that you have examined in the lab uh, with respect to your auditory sensations, so the external ear, remember that's the visible, uh, visible portion of the ear composed of the pinna or auricle and the external auditory uh, meatus, the middle ear, which is composed of, um, it's also called the tympanic cavity, and it's separated from the external auditory meatus by the tympanic membrane or eardrum. The middle ear contains the eardrum, the auditory tube, and the auditory ossicles, the three smallest bones in the body that help to amplify sound. Remember, that's the malus, which is also the hammer, the incus or anvil, and the stapes or stirrup. The stapes or stirrup are bound to the oval window. And um, when the oval window transmits sound waves to the inner ear, this opening allows the sound waves to dissipate. And then you have the inner ear, and the inner ear contains the sensory organs for both hearing and equilibrium in an outer bony labyrinth, which is filled with a fluid called perilymph, and an inner membranous labyrinth filled with fluid called endolymph. Um, the bony labyrinth is basically that dense bone. It surrounds and protects the membranous labyrinth. And within the bony labyrinth is where you find perilymph flowing. And the bony labyrinth is composed of three parts. The vestibule, and that houses the receptors for static equilibrium or linear movements, such as acceleration, deceleration, or your head position relative to gravity, the semicircular canals, which contain the receptors for dynamic equilibrium, or the rotational movements of the head, and the cochlea, which is that snail-shaped structure that contains the receptors for hearing. And here you can see the orientation of the fluids within the inner ear. Now the membranous labyrinth is a collection of fluid-filled chambers that contain endolymph, not perilymph. 
Um, the vestibule contains sacs filled with endolymph, the saccule, and the utricle. The cochlea is composed of three chambers, the scala media, the scala vestibula, and the scala tympani. And there are three semicircular ducts located within the semicircular canals. The receptors within the semicircular duct provide the sensations of rotation within the head. And here you can see the cochlea and cochlear duct. Now, the physiology of hearing. The physiology of hearing um, is such that when the pinna, um, the outer ear, directs sound waves into the external auditory meatus, the tympanic membrane or eardrum vibrates according to the frequency of the sound waves, which can be high or low. The vibration is transmitted from the eardrum to the malus, then to the incus, and finally to the stapes. All of those structures have the ability to amplify the sound waves. The stapes vibrate, pushing the membrane of the oval window in and out. The movement of the oval window causes fluid-filled pressure waves in the perilymph of the scala vestibula. The pressure waves travel through the cochlea towards the round window, and while doing so, that deforms the walls of the scala vestibula and the scala tympani, causing the bacillar membrane to move. Vibrations of the bacillar membrane then cause the hair cells to move against the tectoral membrane. It is those bending of the hair cells finally which causes the depolarization and can generate a nerve impulse that travels to the central nervous system via the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8. And you can see some of those structures mentioned here. So the distortion of the hair cells um, is what is actually going to cause and generate that nerve impulse. The nerve impulse of hearing is interpreted by the auditory cortex, which is located in the temporal lobe of the cerebrum. Now, there is some physiology, uh, some other physiological characteristics of hearing. Pitch is determined by the frequency of the sound waves and is measured in hertz. So a high frequency short wavelength would have a high pitch. Low frequency long wavelength would have a low pitch. Volume um, is measured in decibels and is determined by the amplitude of the sound waves. A high amplitude would be a loud sound. A low amplitude would be a soft sound. And here is the events in hearing that I mentioned previously. Sound waves arrive at the tympanic membrane. The eardrum um, moves, causes displacement of the auditory ossicles. Movement of the stapes at the oval window establishes those pressure waves in the perilymph. The pressure waves distort the bacillar membrane, making their way towards the round window of the tympanic duct. Um, that vibration can cause um, similar vibrations in the hair cells and then information about the intensity of the stimulation is sent via cranial nerve 8 for interpretation and processing. And that's also outlined here for you as well. So as I mentioned, sound perception, um, our sound perception is determined um, by pitch and loudness. And the wavelength is the distance between the two crests of the sound waves. Sound is a pressure disturbance, an alternating area of high and low pressure produced by a vibrating object. Sound waves move in all directions, and they're usually denoted as an S-shaped curve or sine wave. 
And again, the amplitude is the height of the crest. That is whether it's a loud sound or a soft sound. And the frequency is related to the pitch that we hear, which you can see here. And here is some different high, uh, different levels of frequency. High frequency, medium frequency, and low frequency, and how they would elicit a response in those fibers of the bacillar membrane. Sound perception, the intensity of representative sounds are shown here. Um, we cannot hear all sounds, and some sounds are very damaging to the um, ear and the delicate membranes within the ear. Um, of course, we could think of you know, jet planes or gunshots as causing danger or damage to our ear, but even busy traffic noise, if it's continuous, can cause some damage over time. Unfortunately, the damage is very slow to occur and it might take a long time for the effects of damage to our ear and loss of hearing to show up, which generally does later on in life. <clears throat> so here's the pathway to the auditory cortex, stimulation of the hair cells, as I mentioned. That information is carried on the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8, the cochlear nuclei of the medulla oblongata relay that information to the pons and medulla. And the inferior colliculus coordinates responses to the acoustic stimuli. The auditory sensations synapse in the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And then the fibers go to the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. Remember everything about our um, senses travels through the thalamus for processing. Now equally, equilibrium and balance are two other concepts related to our ear. We have equilibri equilibrium receptors in the inner ear and they are part of the vestibular complex. Impulses from the vestibular complex are sent via the vestibular nerve fibers to the brainstem and cerebellum. There's two types of equilibrium. Static equilibrium, which is maintenance of the position of the body relative to the force of gravity. And this is detected by the saccule and utricle of the vestibule. And we also have dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is maintenance of the body position, mostly the head, in response to rotation. Receptors for dynamic equilibrium are located within the ampulla. <clears throat> so here are some of the structures that are associated um, with static equilibrium. The um, hair cells of the saccule and utricle are clustered in oval structures called the macula, which you can see here on the next slide. The macula consists of hair cells that possess stereocilia and kinocilium. These are embedded into um, calcium carbonate crystals known as staticonia, and that makes up the otolithic membrane. And the anatomy of the equilibrium receptors in the utricle and saccule are also shown here. So as I mentioned, static equilibrium um, is measuring the effects of gravity and linear acceleration on the hair cells within the macula. Dynamic equilibrium is maintenance of the body position, mainly in the head in response to rotation. And these receptors are found within the ampulla. The ampulla consists of hair cells known as crista, and they are embedded in um, the cupula, 
when the head rotates in the plane of a semicircular duct, we get a movement of the endolymph, which pushes the cupula to the side, distorting those receptors. And movement of fluid in one direction stimulates the hair cells. Movement in the opposite direction inhibits them. Each of the semicircular ducts responds to one of the rotational movements, like shaking your head no, nodding yes, or tilting your head side to side. And that you can see here. So dynamic equilibrium is analyzing um, the response of the semicircular ducts to rotational movements. And here you can see the movement of the cupula during rotational acceleration and deceleration. Now the pathway of balance and orientation is shown here. So again, we have hair cells of the vestibule and semicircular ducts. They are monitoring body position and motion. The information they are gathering will be carried along the vestibular branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve. That information will go to the vestibular nuclei and the medulla oblongata. The superior colliculi will detect uh, things like eye movements. Um, cranial nerves are involved in eye, neck, and head movements. The vestibular nuclei will relay information about balance and position to the cerebellum. And here you can see the pathway of balance and orientation. So the different receptors that are um, in the body and where those receptors will send information to, either to the cerebellum, our central nervous system for processing, and then the output, whether it's oculomotor control, eye movements, or spinal motor control neck movements. Now some of the disorders of the ear that you should be familiar with, otitis media, infection of the middle ear, otitis externa, infection of the external auditory canal, um, deafness is any hearing loss. You can have conduction deafness where something happens and hampers sound conduction or sensorineural neural deafness, which results from damage to the neural structures. Vertigo is a loss of balance and equilibrium due to an inner ear problem. And tinnitus is ringing or clicking in the ears. The last um, special sense that we're going to examine is vision. And there is some basic anatomy for vision that you should be familiar with. Um, we have several accessory structures that are important in vision. Our eyelids, our eyelashes, they help prevent um, foreign matter from getting into our eyes and shield us from sunlight. We also have our eyebrows. They help shade the eyes from sunlight and prevent perspiration from getting down on, from our forehead into our eyes. Our tarsal glands, our tarsal glands are modified sebaceous glands that help lubricate the eyelid. Conjunctiva, which is a mucous membrane, which is a, lubric a lubricant to prevent the eyes from drying out. If you have infection in the conjunctiva, it's conjunctivitis or pink eye. Um, other anatomical structures within the eye are the um, tarsal glands, which I mentioned in the conjunctiva. You have the extrinsic eye muscles, which move the eye in various positions. You also have the lacrimal apparatus, which produces, distributes, and removes tears and consists of several structures. And then we have the tunics of the eye, which is where we're going to spend the main focus when we examine vision. You have the fibrous tunic, 
the outermost layer of the eye, which provides support and serves as a site of attachment for the extrinsic eye muscles. Um, the sclera is a dense fibrous connective tissue forming the white of the eye, and the cornea is a transparent anterior portion of the sclera. The vascular tunic, the middle layer, contains the choroid, which is a highly vascularized um, pigmented layer of the eye, the ciliary body, a thickened ring of tissue that encircles the lens and is regulated by the ciliary muscle, which helps control the shape of the lens by pulling on the suspensory ligaments, the lens, which is avascular and helps focus light into the sight receptors of the inner tunic, the iris, the colored portion of the eye, and the pupil, the central opening that allows light to enter the eye. Now the neural tunic is the innermost layer of the eye and the retina consists of a thin outer layer that absorbs light and a thick inner layer that contains photoreceptor cells cells that are sensitive to light. We'll examine the rods and the cones, as well as the macula lutea and fovea centralis, the bipolar neurons, ganglion cells, and optic disc of the retina. We also have chambers of the eye, internal chambers. Um, we have a posterior cavity, which is a segment behind the lens, and that's filled with a gel-like substance called the vitreous humor. The anterior cavity, which is a segment in front of the lens, um, filled with a watery, nutrient-rich fluid called the aqueous humor. And you can see the two different chambers there, the lens, the ciliary muscles, the conjunctiva, some of the structures that we've been talking about. Here's another view of the internal eye anatomy and the ciliary app apparatus is shown here, the ciliary muscle, the lens. Now, um, pupil dilation and constriction, remember the lens can change shape, um, the ciliary muscles can assist in changing the shape of the lens by pulling on the suspensory ligaments that extend from the ciliary processes. And that's important in whether we're trying to um, examine something or look at something that's far away versus close up. Okay, the retina. The retina contains some specific types of cells and neurons that are important in our vision. The cones are photoreceptors that operate in bright light and provide high acuity color vision. The rods, photoreceptors that distinguish vision in dim light and also contribute to our peripheral vision. The macula lutea and fovea centralis. The fovea centralis is the highest um, density or highest area of visual acuity because you have the highest density of cones there. The bipolar neurons, they are the rods and the cones of the retina um, that synapse with the bipolar neurons that can then depolarize and transmit nerve impulses to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells form the innermost layer of the retina and these axons will converge at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. The optic disc is also known the blind spot, as the blind spot because there is no photoreceptor cells present there. And this is found at the base of the optic nerve exiting the back of the eye. Here you can see the macula lutea containing the fovea centralis, the optic disc, and blind spot. And now you can see the um, 
different cells, the rods, low light, dim vision, cones, bright light, color vision. You can see the bipolar cells that converge with the ganglion cells and ultimately will converge and exit the back of the eye via the optic disc. Um, the fovea centralis I mentioned, highest density of cones found there. That's the area of greatest visual um, acuity. Um, another view showing you the anatomy of the retina. And in this view, you can see if we take a section of the rods, we can look at the rhodopsin molecule. The rhodopsin molecule is composed of a visual pigment called retinol and opsin, which is a protein. Retinol is synthesized from vitamin A. And so if we are lacking vitamin A in our diet, we would not be able to see at night. And that is known as night blindness. And when retinol and opsin come together, they form um, rhodopsin. So rhodopsin is made from opsin and cis-retinol. And that's important in allowing us to see at night. Now we can only see certain um, wavelengths um, within the visible spectrum. And the different colors, the cones, we have uh, red, green, and blue cones, which is allow us to see in um, the different colors. If someone is colorblind, they might have a problem with one of the cones, either red, green, or blue, impacting their vision. Refraction of light. Refraction of light is bending of a light ray. When light passes through different medians, it can bend or change shape. And it occurs when light meets the surface of a different medium at an oblique angle. And the refraction of light rays, that happens, um, the rays bend as they pass from one substance to another going through our eyes. So from the cornea to the aqueous humor to the lens to the vitreous humor. Now, the accommodation of our lens, remember our lens is a biconvex and it can change its curvature to bend rays depending on the proximity of focus. So if we're trying to see something um, far away, the lens is flattened. If we're trying to see something close up, the lens is curved. And we do have a loss of accommodation that is a natural part of the aging process. As I mentioned previously, the ciliary muscles along with the suspensory ligaments um, help change the shape of the lens. In focusing for distant vision, the ciliary muscles are relaxed, the lens is stretched flat by that tension in the ciliary zonal. Close vision requires us to change the shape of the lens again by the ciliary muscles to increase that refractory power. Um, and another thing that is important in accommodation is which part of your autonomic nervous system is activated. For viewing objects far away, your sympathetic nervous system would be turned on. Viewing things close up, it would be your parasympathetics. So you can see the parasympathetics contract the ciliary muscle, loosen the ciliary zonule, and the lens becomes rounder, allowing it to bulge. And that is important because we need to be able to have that image land exactly where it should on the back of the retina in order for us to properly interpret what we're seeing. So focusing and accommodation is important because if it object is not 
appropriately, if the lens is not appropriately shaped, allowing the um, object to appear exactly where it should in the eye, we can't interpret the, the image we're trying to see. So we can have a problem with refraction. Now, um, normal refraction, emetropic, the focal point falls exactly where it should on the retina. Abnormal refraction, um, myopia, is nearsightedness. The focal point is in front of the retina. And this, for example, it's um, longer than a normal eyeball. Um, it's corrected with a concave lens, which moves the focal point further back. Hyperopia, farsightedness, the focal point is behind the retina. So it's shorter than a normal eyeball. And this is corrected with a convex lens. And it moves the focal point forward. Now, the visual field and visual pathway of the eye is shown here. And the um, visual pathway begins with the photoreceptors, the rods and the cones, which stimulate the bipolar neurons. And the bipolar neurons, in turn, stimulate the ganglion cells. The bipolar neurons produce graded potentials, and those graded potentials can sum to produce an action potential in the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells of the eye are the only ones that produce the true action potentials. The ganglion cells converge at the optic disc, and that penetrates the wall of the eye. The two optic nerves, one from each eye, converge and cross over at the optic chiasma. From that point, the impulse travels to the optic tracts, to the brain. Half of the fibers proceed to the same side of the brain, while the other half cross over to reach the opposite side. And the perception of images and that integration occurs in the visual cortex located in the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. Some of the disorders of the eye that you should be familiar with are shown here. Astigmatism, glaucoma, diplopia, um, color blindness, um, other ones that are not mentioned, myopia, which is nearsightedness, hyperopia, which is farsightedness, astigmatism, unequal curvature of the lens or cornea, um, cataracts, clouding of the lens, and it causes um, images to appear distorted, um, color blindness, a congenital lack of one or more of those different types of cones, the red, blue, or green that I mentioned. It is a sex-linked condition, so it's much more common in males than in females, but it can occur in, in females. Diplopia, double vision, um, retinal detachment, where the retina detaches from the vascular layers of the eye, and that can cause blindness, and glaucoma where we have increased intraocular pressure, which can also increase to dangerous levels and compress on the retina and optic nerve. And that can cause blindness as well. That completes the overview of sensory perception.